Hi, this is Brian Powers from the uh, <coughs> Main Library in Cincinnati, Ohio. And today we are interviewing Frank Payne, who was a local musician here in the Cincinnati area. And we're going to talk a little bit about his music career and some of the other things he did in his life, including his uh, career at the Law Library and the Court of, Appear Appear <laughs> Court of Appeals in Cincinnati. Today's date is February 4th, 2016. Uh, Mr. Payne, thank you very much for taking some time and uh, talking to us about your uh, your career. It's a pleasure. Um, well, I want to start out and ask you, where were you born? Well, I was born in a little town called Allensville, Kentucky, but I lived, I was raised in Covington, Kentucky, like all of my life. But uh, mother went there to have the baby uh, uh, one summer. I actually lived in Covington all my life, Covington, Kentucky. Your your parents did were they uh, always in Kentucky, or did they move to Kentucky from somewhere else? They were always in Kentucky. Uh, I moved to Cincinnati uh, probably in 50, 1954, but they've always been in Kentucky. Yeah. And I call Covington my home, Covington, Kentucky. Did your what kind of uh, work did your dad do when you were growing up? He worked at the Cincinnati Milling Machine Company. Uh, out in Oakley, Cincinnati, Ohio. Oh, okay. Yeah. God, how did you get the work from Covington? Because well, it was a streetcar? It was a streetcar, yes. Yeah. I worked there for about a year, and I had about a 1940 Chevrolet when I first came out of high school before I went back to school. And I would take my father and several other men that worked at the plant. I'd pick them up and take them back home with my new 1940 Chevrolet. I was 18 years old then. How, uh, how long did your dad work at the Cincinnati Mill? My father was there for over 25 years, I think, but I was only there for 18 months. Right. Yeah. What kind of work did your dad do there? He was in charge of what they call the oral house uh, and supplied the you know, oral and towels and things like that for the shop. Uh, uh, what, what kind of sh hours? Was it day hours or did he have to do different shifts? He worked day hours, like from maybe 7 in the morning till 5 or 6 in the evening. They did 10-hour shifts during that time. It was during the war, I think, for war years. And we worked Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. We worked uh, eight hours on Sunday, eight hours on Saturday. I think it was 10 hours on during the week. Were you working there after you got out of high school? That was my first job. Were you, I, were you in the same department as your dad, or were you working? Originally, I was not in this department. Uh, about six months before I, I quit the milling machine, I was transferred to his department. Yeah. Okay. D did your mom work? No, mother never worked. And how many uh, brothers and sisters did you have? Uh, one brother and one sister. And, and where did you fall in line? Were you oldest or youngest? I am the oldest. Okay. Uh, the sister was the youngest. And uh, I was the oldest, yes. Mm -hmm. And what, what uh, schools did you go to growing up? Well, I went to uh, Lincoln Grant School. That was the elementary school, and then William Grant High School, all in the same building but uh, different levels. Lincoln Grant was the lower schools, and uh, William Grant was the high school. And what part of Covington did you live in? Uh, <laughs> well, I lived on the east side. Okay. East side of Covington, yeah. Uh -huh. Was the school near near where you lived, or was it a bit of a was it? Did you have to walk there? Originally, our school was on Seventh Street. It was about a twenty-minute walk. But in I think in nineteen thirty something, they built a new school on the, at uh, Ninth and Greenup, and uh, it didn't have it very didn't have too far to walk. But it was a nice school, a nice looking school, and. Uh, and um, now you started getting into music very young, didn't you? 
I started studying piano when I was six years old. And when I was 12 years old, I was playing for the, some of the churches in the area. Was, uh, was there a lot of musicians in your family, or did your parents want you to learn how to piano, or did you want to? How did that come about that you, you were learning piano at such a young age? Well, my father used to come home from work. We had an old Vic Solis that used to wind up, and I'd be standing there hitting on the side of the, for him to play the Vic Tola. I said, play the music, something like that, I would say. And he said, maybe this boy wants to be a musician. And uh, there was a, a piano teacher named Andrew Johnson Sr. He was teaching some students in the area. My wife found out about him, and she acquired him to teach me. That was my first teacher. And would you go to him? Did he have a place that you go to, or would he come to your no, house? No, he would come to my house. He lived in Cincinnati, but he'd come to my house. It's less than a dollar a lesson. I don't see how he did it, but he did. One, once a week, uh, it went on for years. So what kind of music was he teaching you to play? What songs and stuff? At that time, he, he didn't want me to play jazz, but I picked it up on my own. But I was playing, uh, I was doing the, the three Bs, Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, and things like that, and when, uh, at an early age, I did a couple of classic co concerts at, 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 the, at my church. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, that time, I was at First Baptist Church of Covington, and uh, it was my first concert. But I, I played most, mostly classical music uh -huh. early days. Then I picked up jazz later. Was was he? Um, was that was primary his job? Would you think was teaching, or did he? Was he? Uh, was he? involved with some band or organization. I mean, how, did he just make his money from teaching, you think? Or do you remember much? I, I, everybody had another job earlier, but uh, I don't know what that, what that was. Uh, as far as I know, he just taught piano. How, how long was he, uh, was your teaching you piano? How many, was that a period of years? Several years, I don't know the exact number, but several years he, he taught piano. Now, when you were starting to take piano, did you like piano, or was that something you had to grow to like, or was that something you liked to do? No, I beginning? always always loved piano, yeah. Always loved the piano. And, and was, uh, he, was he teaching you how to read music at that age? Yes, uh-huh, yeah. Sometimes when I didn't have my lessons like I should, he cracked my knuckles on the, uh, <laughs> the next, next week I did better. <laughs> Yeah. Did your parents own like a phonograph player or anything? Uh, did, did you? How would you? How would you uh, hear music uh, records or I guess also the radio? Well, we had the radio, and we had a a piano that used to have rolls, put the rolls on and pump it and play music like that. I played a lot of those songs, and uh, I guess I picked up music from that for doing that, but uh, I always loved it. And uh, we didn't have any at that time, record players, things like that, but uh, so, uh, I don't know, I, I just just love music, just to start playing. And I guess you were also being exposed to music while going to church, you said you were part of the church. Oh yes, I did. Uh, I started playing for the Sunday school at my church, and then I got involved with the other churches where I played. How old were you when you started playing at the churches? About 11, 12 years old, I think. I'm sure I was playing at 12 years old, yeah. What kind of music were you playing in the churches? Just more or less like the hymns, mm -hmm. and they had a, a book of hymnals, and I think the the biggest book at that time was called Gospel Pearl, and most of the churches had that that book, and uh, all of them used it. Then they came out with the Baptist hymnals and the modern hymnals, something like that, but they're all hymns, and that's what most of the churches did in the early years when I started playing. Yeah, but a big difference now. Now, um, 
when you started playing, you you were about six. What year were you born? Like 1922. 22. So this is the late 20s you started playing piano, I guess. Yeah, I started when I was six years old. That would be what, 1928. Yeah. But I wasn't playing piano that time. I just started. <laughs> But you, were you, uh, you had access to the radio. I guess you're hearing songs on the radio. Oh yes, yes. Uh -huh. Do you remember what stations you listened to or what shows? No, I don't. I mean, I guess WLW was starting to come about. Did you ever remember listening to WLW or out of Cincinnati? Yes, I, WLW. I don't remember too many other stations, but. I was just wondering if, if you, I know Fats Waller was on WLW in the, in the 30s. I was wondering if you ever remember hearing oh, yes. him on the, on the radio or anything. I heard, I remember him. And uh, in fact, when I started playing, we did some of the songs he did at Toddy's place of play. He had one called Your Feet's Too Big. Right. And, uh, and uh, Ain't Misbehaving, some of those he did. So, uh, yeah, I remember Fats, Fats Waller. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, that your teacher really was teaching you classical music and that you later was, you started learning how to play jazz. How did you get introduced to jazz music? I really, I don't know, there was a song called Honeysuckle Rose and I picked that up. I think I got it from Fast Waller mm -hmm. and started playing that quite often, different places I would, would go and then the, I became interested that I went to a school in Covington called Paris School of Music, where I took up some uh, harmony and arranging. And he had all the popular songs that were on the radio at that time. There was a show on TV that came on, I think, every Saturday. Mm -hmm. It had all the popular songs. I probably forgot the name of it, but it. The teacher at that time had all those songs and we gave me copies and we started playing and so And I had a, there was a band called A.B. Townsend at the Sportsman Club in, in, in Newport. He had the band over there and he invited me over to play with him and I just started playing. I wasn't taught anything, so I just picked it up, you know. Well. Uh, how old were you when you started playing in clubs? When did you move from playing in churches and started playing in, in clubs around the uh, area? You know, how old, were you a, just still a teenager or was that I would, a I would older? I would estimate about 18 years old. You yeah. think you were, you, you, were, you think you were still in high school when you started doing that? Or you think you, after you got out of high school? Mostly after I finished high school. Yeah, most of that. Do you, do you remember what, uh, did you graduate? What, what, maybe uh, 1940 or something like that? 1939. 39, class yeah. of 39? Uh -huh. And then you started working at the Cincinnati Mill, you said. Yeah, well, I had to wait a year before I could get in the mill because I graduated when I was 17 years old and I couldn't take the job until I was 18. So I had to wait a year before I could get, get the job. And it, during that time, I don't know what I did. <laughs> Between <laughs> 17 and 18, <laughs> I guess I... I may have been playing some. I, I imagine I was doing some playing during that time. Now, before the interview, you mentioned your brother. He was a musician too, but he didn't play piano. No, he played saxophone, saxophone, flute, clarinet. How did how did he come about with those instruments? Do you know, I don't know. When he left here, he went in the navy, and he played in the navy band. But he was playing before he went in the navy because uh, he played with me. In my group on occasions. Right. I don't remember how he picked up the saxophone, but he was playing in high school. Yeah. Um, now, uh, 41, the J Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor, do you remember where you were when you heard about that? Yes, I was working at the, uh, I was playing then, but I was working at the uh, Court of Appeals Messenger. The messenger, but I hadn't been hired uh, full time until I came out of the army. But I was working in the messenger because they. You were working there before you got into the army. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. you got a job at in downtown Cincinnati. Right. Okay. Yeah. I know it was, 
there was something, a, a place across the street from, from a federal building, there was flash across the screen what was happening at Pearl Harbor. I was standing in the window looking to see that from the courthouse. That was, that was 41, yeah. But I was a full-time employee at that time. How did, how did you remember how you got that job at the Court of Appeal, Appeals? Yes. A, a clerk named, uh, I think his name was Menzies, was a friend of a, a friend of mine in Covington. And he asked if, she, if he knew, knew of someone, and she recommended me to him. And that's where I got the job. Mm -hmm. And so when the war broke out, um, did you get drafted shortly after that? Or you, you ended up in the Army at some point. How did that happen? Do you it was about a, well, we had to register, register for the draft. And I was drafted uh, about a year later. I think Do you remember the day you got the letter? No, I remember the day I, December, I went in the following year. I don't remember the exact day. <laughs> it was in December of 42? Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. And you were talking earlier before the interview that, uh, that I, I guess you had a report to Fort Thomas? Yes. Uh -huh. But uh, you, how, how did, I, did you, where did you first report to? To a recruitment office first or something? No, we got a letter through the mail. Right. That, that, and uh, I responded to the draft board. Was, where, where were they at, the draft board? There's someplace downtown Covington, probably a courthouse or something. I don't remember exactly. Right. I didn't go to the board. I wrote a, wrote a letter, I think it was. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. But where did you, I know you ended up at Fort Thomas, but you went, didn't you go somewhere before Fort Thomas? You had to no, I went directly from Covington to Cincinnati and then to Fort Thomas. And they, uh, they didn't pick you up. You basically, they, what, didn't someone give you some tokens that get there on your own? <laughs> yes. Can you talk a little about that? <laughs> well, they uh, sent a letter to meet a certain place downtown. They didn't pick us up with it. The army van or anything. They had about 12 of us. It was two men, a fellow named Foster, one named Jackson, and they called the names and said, you don't have to go, you come on back. You're 45 years old. So they called Frank Payne. I wasn't 45, but I thought that they were gonna tell me to go home too. But they didn't. They gave me a, some tokens. We had to put in the, the slot to go across the river. And uh, he said, you should go and hire us on the test. You in charge of these men going to Fort Thomas. Well, we had to take, you could get each person to talk about that part. Mm -hmm. But we took the talkers, put them in the stern style, and they had to catch another bus in Cincinnati to get to Fort Thomas. And they even sent a, bath, uh, a car to pick us up. So that's the way we got to Fort Thomas. <laughs> I didn't like it, but <laughs> what's, what's it going to do, you know? So when you got to Fort Thomas, what, what are your memories of Fort Thomas? What did, what, what did you do when you got there? We didn't stay there at no time. They, they sent us to Union Station, Union Terminal. They carried a truck to Union Terminal. And we woke up the next day. We were in uh, Fort McClellan, Alabama. Wow. So yeah. you went to Fort Thomas. What did, did they have just... Uh, Give you your your uniforms or something there. What was going on at Fort Thomas? You were just processed or something. The process there, yeah, and they sent it right on the way to to uh, the station. To they put you right on the train there, and then you were the next day. You're in Alabama. Right, right. They pulled the blinds down. We couldn't see where we were going on the train, and uh, I guess the guys went to sleep and woke up the next day. We were Fort McClellan, Alabama. Next morning. Now, when you're on the train and when you're at Fort Thomas, were you basically separated from white people and you were just African Americans together, or at that point, are you sort of? No, we had separate, uh, separate barracks, separate uh, places where we ate, separate restrooms. Everything was separated. What, what about on the train uh, down there to Alabama? Were you, were you guys? I, I didn't see any others, uh, other except the ones in my, my cabin, the train. Right. 
but you were everybody was African American in your in your cat with right. your training. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> so when you arrived in Alabama, what what was your memories of that? Is this and by the way, is this the first time you've been out of the Cincinnati area, or have you been have you been able to travel uh, before before this? Not too far from home. Uh, uh, not too far from home, down, in, down in Kentucky, maybe this is that area. I had done a lot of traveling. So this is the farthest you've been away from, from the area. Oh, yes. So yes. What, were, what was your feeling when you arrived in Alabama? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to go back home. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I wasn't too happy with that. But uh, I made it for a while. Yeah. Did you... Uh, Make friends quickly, or any anybody that you, did you uh, hang out with when you arrived down there? First? Well, the musicians we used to make friends with each other, and uh, I became a member of the the band and the orchestra. So, well, explain how when you first went down there, were you going down the boot camp, I guess, in the army? Oh yes, we had basic training. Okay, and how long was that? About thirteen weeks. Everybody had to have basic training for thirteen weeks before we. Had, took part in the, uh, other activities. And then we went through a certain amount of training. Uh, and, and in your training in boot camp, it was it, you were just with African Americans and you were restricted, I guess. Oh yes, yes. What were some of the things you were restricted, uh, what were some of your memories of, of that? Well, I mean, uh, like I said, we had separate uh, eating places, separate laboratory, laboratory and uh, just everything was separate. We, we weren't with the whites at all. Mm -hmm. You know, had segregated buses to take us to town, things like that. They had whites on the bus, but by the time they got to us, the bus was so filled, we'd have to get a cab to go to town. Right. Yeah. I didn't like that. Um, what, were, what about your instructors? Did you have white drill sergeants, or did you have? We had a black drill sergeant, but my, uh, Sergeant over the music department, the band and the orchestra, uh, over the band, it was a white, a lieutenant, I can feel, I liked him, he was very nice. In the orchestra, we had a, a black uh, drummer, Joe Murphy, he was real nice too. Well, before we get into the band, I was you mentioned the city, where would you, where would you go into town? What was near the base? Uh, Anderson, Alabama, very segregated, yeah. If we went to the theaters, you had a certain section for you way up in the balcony, some place to sit. Eating places, everything was segregated, mm -hmm. including the, well, every place was segregated. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So was that where you were when you would go into town? Is that what you do? Would you go see bands or go go out to eat or? We never. I never went to town except. Uh, uh, when my wife came down. We were married. I think we went to the show a couple of times. She stayed a little while and came back to Cincinnati. But I never went to town for anything. Was, well, let's backtrack. So you got married at some point. When, where did you meet her? Was she someone you knew from Covington or something? Yeah, yeah. We were the same school and same church and all. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was I wasn't married very long before I was in the army. Right. Yeah. And she came down after a while. And. Uh, So how did you end up, uh, did you take a test? Did they knew that you were a musician? How did you get into uh, being a, a band? And, and, uh, well, I, get, I, I think I registered as a musician okay. while I went in, yeah. And they knew that. Because the first day I was there, we went into this big barracks, and uh, I think it was a chaplain. We had a whole lot of uh, soldiers and he said, if anybody here that plays piano and reads, stand up. So I was the only one that stood up. And then uh, I went, to, he said, report to my office tomorrow morning after you uh, have your basic training. And that's where I got started. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so when you started with the band, you were playing piano. What kind of, how many members were in the band and what, what were kind of uh, events were you playing at and stuff? What were the activities? Well, we had a large band. Uh, we had musicians from all different places, and we had a large band. 
they had a nice orchestra. Uh, Joe Murphy was our orchestra leader, and we played uh, for dancers, for the, for the officers. We played the, the U.S. show on Sunday on, a, on radio that time. And uh, I enjoyed it. We did a lot of rehearsing during the, <laughs> during the daytime. And uh, we played for retreat in the evenings. Uh, you, you mentioned that some of the soldiers would call you guys, they had a name for you guys. They called us Gold Brickers. Gold, I don't I still don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> but they called us Gold Brickers. I guess we had it easier than they did because we did a lot of rehearsing while they were out on the field, you know. And were you at this time just playing around the base that you did basic training at? Music. Yeah, did you get transferred out somewhere else or were you staying in Alabama? I stayed in Alabama until I was discharged. Okay, so you were, and that fort was, what was the fort? Fort McClellan. Fort McClellan. Okay, so you were, the whole time you were in your service, you stayed at, at that fort. Right, right. I and worked at the officer's club and even after I unit moved out, I worked at the officer's club to put me in the hospital. I was there for several weeks before I was retired. Right. Mm -hmm. So what kind of music were you, would you have to change the music you guys were playing depending on uh, the audience or? No, I guess they accepted what we did. We had uh, music from, uh, we had stock arrangements from uh, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, Glenn Miller bands like that, stock arrangements. We played their, their music. Did you take requests? We probably did. <laughs> <laughs> I think you mentioned sometimes you would uh, have to entertain, entertain officers' wives while they were in meetings. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, while the officers were in, me in meetings, the wives would be in a little small club, maybe having a cocktail or something, and I would play piano to entertain them during that time. Yeah. And then when the, they would have a maybe officers meeting. I would play piano also, when some of the big wheels, big wheels were there. I'd play to entertain them. Did you always have sheet music when you were playing, or did you did you were you able to just play whatever by ear and by memory? Did you do some of that sometimes? Well, for the just for anything, no, for the service. like for the band music, and for a lot of the uh, most of the uh, orchestra meeting, we had uh, sheet music. They had uh, arrangements like that. But, but some things I did on my own that I picked up before I went in there, yeah, I'd play. In fact, I played for the soldiers sometimes at night. I would come down and play. They would take up a collection, give me a tip, play it for them. Were you, were you playing any jazz at that point? Oh, yeah, yeah. In fact, the Red Cross used to make uh, little tapes, records, and uh, the men would send messages home to their wives. This was when I was in the hospital. And uh, I would play songs like Don't Get Around Much Anymore, mm -hmm. or whatever that was popular during that time. They would do, give a little message to their wives or sweethearts along with the music. Oh. So I, I did a lot of copies of those, a lot of tapes. Well, how were they recording you for that? Did they have a little mobile oh, recording yes. unit? They had a recording unit there. Were you just doing it on the barracks or wherever the piano was? Well, they had a piano in the, in the hospital where we stayed. Okay. In that, like a little auditorium. Oh, you were doing this while you were in the hospital. Right, that time. right. Okay. Yeah. But I was there for several weeks. Oh, uh, that explains why the Red Cross, that you got hooked up with them, right? Right. They were putting you to work. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and they, the men really enjoyed it. They, they have a nice message for the wives, or, <laughs> and they play different songs. Songs that are very popular during that time, maybe Stardust, something like that. Yeah. And uh, songs you don't hear much anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So with the, the Red Cross had like, what is it like a little? Uh, I guess at that time in the early '40s, it would have been. It, they didn't have tape. It was. It must have been. Uh, the little plastic records. Well, plastic. It, it would just record right onto the little record. Right. right. And it was a portable unit. That's right. Yeah. With one little mic or something. Uh, That's it. Yeah. That's it. And you would do radio broadcasts for the for USO. On Sunday we did, yes. And where were you at when you were doing that? You were just in some, not a studio, you must have been in some auditorium and they would just broadcast it live? 
I think they took us to town somewhere at a studio, as I remember. We didn't broadcast on the, from the base. We went somewhere else to do the broadcasting. But, uh, and how long was the radio show? Maybe 30 minutes, something like that. And you would do that like every Sunday morning? Sometimes Sunday. Yeah. Okay. It wasn't con that consistent, but you would do it. Uh, Some Sundays, uh, I would get on the truck, what we call, go to the bivouac area. And I had a little organ, and I'd pump up my feet and uh, play music. And they had hymnals for the soldiers, they'd pass them out. And then the chaplain would speak, and the men would try to sing a few songs we had there. It was interesting. But I didn't, I didn't work too long for the chaplain because he was moved somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So the new chaplain never contacted me. Now the band that you have, how, how many members would you say was in the band? We had a large band, I would say at least 20. I, I showed you the, the lineup we had there. Was it, a, was it all African-American musicians or? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I think you said that the musical director, he wasn't. Was no. he a white guy, a guy who was? Yeah, a fellow called Lieutenant Eichenfeld. He didn't direct the band, he was just over the band. Like, I don't know who, did, who directed the band. Was he sort of the guy who took care of your booking your gigs and things? Yeah, well, I guess he set up whatever necessary for us. But uh, he was white. Lieutenant I can feel like, uh, nice. I liked him. He was very nice. Uh, but Joe Murphy was a orchestra leader. And we had, as I say, stock rain was spread out and just read it, mm -hmm. go on and play and rehearse. So when you weren't when you weren't uh, doing uh, uh, music stuff, what were you doing on the bass? Would you do any other kind of activities? Uh, 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 Mrs. Parr is on the phone. She oh yeah, I'm she's coming to see her next. She's my next. Yes, she didn't even talk to her. Uh, she said she she wanted to know about what. Uh, she said that's a big place she's in. She wanted to make sure she's in her her there and in. Where you can find her when you come. Probably, probably in about an hour, because you guys are, we'll probably wrap this up in about a half an hour, and then, okay. uh, and then, because you guys got to go to the doctor's appointment. Right? We have a doctor's appointment at 2 o'clock. Yeah, so I'm going to, um, we'll, we'll wrap this up in about a half an hour. So I'll probably be around her place around 2 or so. Okay. Wherever, how long it takes me to get here? Up, she's up in Sharonville. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So 2, 2.15? Two okay, all right. I have all right, thanks a lot. All right. Yeah, I'm going to go visit uh, Ms. Parm. We're going to have her at the library in, a, oh, yeah. in a, a couple of weeks. Okay. So I have a little bit of paperwork she's got to fill out for our, our counting people. Okay. Um, so uh, I was asking about the, oh, things that you would do on the base. You just hang out, uh, stay out of trouble? No, well, my wife was there the times. She would come out with a cab. We go to the theater. On the base, we go there, see. And uh, that's about the only time she would come out. Then I would go to town. Mm -hmm. I'd go to town, I'd, I'd get a ride in as long as she was there, especially on Sundays uh, before we do the broadcast or afterward. I would go to town. When she wasn't there, did you have any buddies you made that you would hang out and do stuff with, or you just kind of? It was on the base where we did. We didn't, go to t we didn't go to town for anything special. Yeah. But you said at some point you started having some back trouble. Oh, I had back trouble before I got in the Army. <laughs> I had an automobile accident on a bicycle. And uh, the day I went to my graduation, I was strapped down so tight I couldn't hardly move. And it, the doctor said as you get older, other writers probably going to sit in and uh, be affected. But they told me in service, I had a curved spine, the doctor there or something. And uh, I progressively gotten worse over the years. But when you were there, I guess it got bad enough that you ended up in the hospital there. They did that before they discharged you. Uh, so I was in the hospital, along with quite a few other soldiers. What they call it, they give you a CDD discharge, honorable discharge, but you can't do the duty. 
So after you got out of the service, you, you came back to Covington? Yes. Uh -huh. And did you know what you wanted to do at that point? I wanted to play music, but I tried to get another job, and, and they told me they couldn't hire me because of my back. They had every work to do. Uh, so I went back to playing music. <laughs> And so where were you, when you came back, where did you start playing at? What clubs or? Uh... I think the sportsman club was the first one. I came back. I had worked there before, I went in service. So the sportsman's club, that was over in uh, Newport, right next to Covington. Right, Newport, yeah. How, do you know, and so sportsman's club, I think, was started by another guy named Payne, but not a relative of yours. Steve Payne, yeah. They all thought we were relatives, but we were not. We were friends. I worked for him. I think he's the first one to start the sportsman club. Mm -hmm. Do you know when the sportsman's club started? Was it maybe the 30s, you think? Or do you know how before you started playing there in the mid 40s? It was probably in the 40s. I don't, as far as I know, it was the 40s. It may have been earlier, but I think I was one of the first groups to play for the sportsman club. So when you started playing there after you got out of the service, did you? get like a bunch of guys together, a band, a trio, or did you start playing there and that eventually happened? How did your trio get together? Well, I found that a couple of fellas that were musicians who needed work, wanted to work, they put them together and we got my, got my trio together at first with. I guess you don't remember how you found those guys. Was it in a music ad or just uh I may have checked with the Musicians Union, and may not, I don't recall, but there was always somebody around that knew someone that, exactly how I found them, I don't remember. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to ask, when you, did you, would you go out to uh, see live music when you were growing up as a teenager or anything? Would you go see uh, bands or artists that would come to town? Were there venues that you would go to? Oh yes, uh, I went to, uh, there were places like uh, Ezra Charles Coliseum. Okay, right. Where they had big bands on, on Sunday night if I wasn't, hadn't been working. Duke Ellington, Cal Basie, uh, Billy Eckstein, all had bands. They would come over there. But after I started working at the Sportsman Club, uh, what, they would finish work over at Cincinnati at like 2.30, and I worked from 11 at night to 6 in the morning, the sportsman club. <laughs> they would come over there and sit in some of the musicians and jam with me. Right. So that's where I met a whole lot of guys. No, I, the other place that I always hear about, because I think the Coliseum, as a child, that was over in the West End in Cincinnati, wasn't it? I think it, that was 7th Street. And, and then there was also the Cotton Club that was around that time. It was, kind of, it was on Six and Mound. Right. And then, yeah. And um, so did you, would you go to the Cotton Club at all? Did you go see much there? I would go sometimes, what they call Blue Monday. Uh, they had special dances on Blue Monday. If I had been, if I wasn't working, I'd take the wife over on the, uh, but that was very few times because most time I worked on Mondays. What, what was Blue Monday? That's what they called it. That's a special dance. Oh, Blue okay. Monday, yeah. And that would be on, at the Cotton Club? They would do Cotton Club, Club, yes. Yeah. Was that, would that be in the evenings? No, that would be at night. Yeah. Yeah. Like 9, 10 o'clock at night. Uh, so, uh, so when you started doing the Cotton Club, how many nights a week were you playing there? No, I didn't play the Cotton Club. I mean, I'm not the Cotton Club. The Sportsman's Club. How many nights were you playing there after you got out of the service? Were you doing like? Probably six nights, but you had a night off, uh, about six nights a week. Mm -hmm. And what time would your night start? Like, what time would you show up there at the club to play? 11 o'clock. At night, 11 o'clock? Yeah, see, we worked from 11 at night to 6 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to believe, but it's true, yeah. The sportsman's club, what was going on before 11 there? People were just drinking or something? Or was there any music? Was there another act before you? No, uh, they were just, just drinking and, and uh, whatever else 
whatever was going on there. So at that time, Steve Payne is the owner of the Sportsman's Club. Yes. What do you What do you remember about him? His personality. What was he like? To me, he was a fine person. Real nice. Totally quiet. Uh, nice. They had a very small club when he first opened it up. Mm -hmm. Very small. Then uh, later on, later years, they built a larger, larger spot. But at that time, it was a, was it just like a stage you were playing on, and people would sat at tables. They had tables around, and we were like in one corner of the, of the room. Uh -huh. they, they, they never had a stage at that time. Oh, well, you were just in a corner, yeah. not a proper stage. Right. Yeah. Um, now, at, at at one point, I guess by sometime forty eight, forty nine, you sort of like the house band there, aren't you? At the Sportsman's Club. Oh yes, after I came out of service, I had the group there for a while. And, uh, but at some point, Lonnie Johnson, the, gu the guitar player, he, you're sort of backing him up, right? At some point, at, at the Sportsman's Club. No, that was the 333 Club. See, the oh, okay. three I had left the Sportsman Club. The 333 Club was right across the street from the Sportsman Club. Well, who owned that? I don't remember who owned that club, but uh, Lonnie Johnson and I worked together for several months over there. So why uh, why did you leave the Sportsman's Club and went across the street? More money? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that part either. Uh, Were you remember. working the same hours at the, oh, I'm sorry, the 333 Club? What was it called? I don't think we worked as long as. You didn't work till till uh, sunrise? I don't remember the exact hours over there. I remember he, Lonnie worked with us. With uh, he would be a feature. I would do the entertainment. And then he would come on maybe like three, three times a night and do something like that. So how did you, uh, how did you, how did that come about that you were working with Lonnie Johnson? Because he, I think he had a contract with King Records at that point, and I think he had a hit song like uh, Tomorrow Night. Uh, yeah, I, I made a couple of records with him at King's Records. Right, right. Yeah. But do you remember, did he just start playing there and you were like the house band there or something? I was there before he came. Right. Yeah, and, he, and they, they brought him in and featured uh, during, the, during the day, during the evening. I was there when he came to Cincinnati, I guess. Mm -hmm. When he start working at three thirty three club, mm -hmm. but you would do it like maybe a set of your, your music that you guys are doing, and then he would come in and and you would back him on his songs. Yes, uh -huh. and then you'd go back and forth throughout the evening, kind of thing. Yeah, we we would come over during the daytime and rehearse the songs that he was going to do, and then we the night we we do them together, but uh, we always had a rehearsal. He did just come in and start singing. We play. Mm -hmm. We rehearsed what he was going to do. Mm -hmm. and, and what was he? What was his personality like working with him? Was he okay to work with? Yeah, he, he was, was he nice. Demanding or was he? No, no, no. He was a very nice person. Yeah, yeah. Right. he lived in over in Avondale. Yeah, he bought a house over in Avondale. Though. I think on I forgot the name of the street. I think it's, it was on Rockdale. Rockdale. That's right. Yes, he had us over a couple of times at his house for. You know, a little lunch or something. Oh yeah. Yeah, he, I like Lonnie. He was, he was a nice fella. Yeah. yeah, we had no problems together. We worked worked fine together. Mm -hmm. But around that time period, he tomorrow night was a was a pretty big hit for him. Yeah. I don't think he had a hit uh, for some time before that. I mean, he had a long career, you know, going yeah. back. Yeah. But I think he hadn't had a hit in a long time, and I think that time period he was yeah. starting to have some hits and stuff. And yeah, we made a couple records at Kings. And then uh, somebody showed me a, a, a blues book that my name was in the blues book with his. Uh -huh. Have you seen a copy of that? No, but I've seen your name on these sessions with Lonnie Johnson. Yeah. Uh -huh. But do you remember going over the King Records, the studio and stuff? Sure, yes. Now, that, was that the first time you had done like uh, a recording in a, in a recording studio before? Or? Yes, yeah. it was the first time. So what are your what are your memories of the of the studio? Do you have much memories of what that was what the room was like or anything? Are they the engineers or? No, 
It wasn't a very big place, I remember that. Mm -hmm. I don't think. And uh, I don't remember a whole lot about the engineering and all that stuff. I know we cut some records. <laughs> right, right. I had some I kept in my basement. There was a, the slate type, we call them, and then it cracked. Uh, like the, the, on the shellac? The, on yeah, the, on yeah. The, the, uh, Thicker. Yeah, the old 78s. 78s, that were on, uh, 78s yeah. Made of shellac. I had them in my garage, and uh, they stayed there for a long time. I went to pick them up one day, and it all cracked. Oh. Yeah. I have them on CD. I can get them if you want them. I got those recordings with you. Have you? I'd like to have them. Yeah, yeah, I'll get that for you. Okay. But, um... So you, I think you, you did a couple of recordings with him. Did you keep playing with him at over there in Kentucky? No. Uh, After he left there, where I, we, we parted. Uh, did you continue to play there, or did, did he leave, or how long did you keep playing at the? Is it the three 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 club? What was it called? I don't remember that. How long we played? Whether he left or we did or whatnot. Yeah. I don't remember that. But did you keep playing there? Were you still the house band there? I may have been. I, 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 see, I don't remember. And I was going to say, you're playing with Ed Conley, the bass player at that time. Yes, okay. yes. And who was your, your drummer? I have a guy's name here as a... Uh, what's the guy's name? Did I write it down? No. Okay. I think I wrote his name down. Oh, Earl Wood? Earl Wood, yeah, Early Wood. Was yeah. he your drummer? He may have been, but he worked, we worked together for a long time. That's who they have down as the, they have Ed Conley as the bass player, your piano, and then they have Earl Wood as the drummer. Yeah, it, it probably was Early Wood, because we, we left there and went to Castle, Castle Grand in Cincinnati. Okay. The group, I'm sure you call it Uptown Cats. Right. Yeah, well, Early Wood was the drummer, yes. So. How long did Ed Conley play in your trio? He left me at the Sportsman Club. I think I went back to the Sportsman Club. Uh, he got a, he had a job at the post office. That's right. He became a mailman, right? Yeah, and he worked at night, and he couldn't play any longer. So he left me at right. that time. But he worked for a long time with me. Yeah. A good musician. He was with me at the uh, Downbeat. Later on, right? Yeah, Ooh, yeah. yeah. Ed was a good musician. I hate to lose him, but I had, a, I got another very good guy, D.R. Nelson. He was great. And he ended up playing with you for decades, right? Of uh, 40 years, yeah. yeah. So you said you went back to the Sportsman's Club? You went back yeah. to play back there again? Yeah, I was at the Sportsman's Club more than once, because I, I went back after I left service of the Army. But, you know, there was a new sportsman club that I never played in, down by the bridge. Yeah, underneath the bridge. Yeah, I think yeah. that was later in the 60s. Yeah, yeah. I think that, I, I'm thinking you're there in the early 50s and stuff. Yeah. You were there, wasn't there the guy, uh, Zach White? Zach White, yeah. What did he do at the sportsman? What was his job? He was the manager for a while there. Uh, Zach was another friend of mine. He he didn't he wasn't playing in the instrument at that time, but he had, he had had a band at one time around Cincinnati, I think. Yeah, he was a pretty well known, a big band leader, I guess, back yeah. in the thirties, yeah. maybe in the twenties, I think. And a lot of people played in his band. Yeah, it was a little before my time, but I, I knew Zach. You knew him from the sportsman. Yeah, club he was he was older than I. What uh, was what was he like? I mean, was he a guy that you worked with? Like, did he like book your shows for you? No, he just uh, was managing. Oh, he was managing the whole place. He ran the club. I don't think he ran the club. I think maybe uh, he did the entertainment or something. Okay. I don't know. I know. I know he was there for a while. I don't know exactly what he did, but was was he working there when Steve Payne was still the owner, or did he come in when Screw Andrews was running the place? I don't remember that either. Uh, but I know he was there. But, uh, and, yeah, were you playing there when Screw Andrews was, was the owner? No, I had gone before that. I was at Tony's. Oh, okay. Tully's. So you never 
You never uh, worked for Screw Rangers or, or, or Yes, played? I did. Yes, I did. But uh, we just, let's Steve see. Payne. I worked for him, but uh, I, I left there. I don't know when it was. It came to Cincinnati. But I did work for, for Screw Andrews, yeah. The years and time, I don't know exactly. Sure, right, right. But I did work for him. Because I remember he came to a college one time, well, I don't know if I wanted to come back. I said, no, I'm happy over here. <laughs> I'm happy over here, yeah. yeah. Now, in this time period, when you're playing over there in, the, in, in uh, Newport, where are you living in town? Or did you move over to Cincinnati, or were you still living in Kentucky? I was in Kentucky. Over Covington, yeah. But at some point you moved over here, because you're here now. 1954, I moved over here, Cincinnati. Where, where did you move to? What neighborhood? Stove Lane. Oh, okay, right. Silverton. Yeah, Silverton. Yeah. So you moved there in 54? Yeah. Was there a reason why Silverton? I had friends out there, friends in, in Kennedy Heights. But that was still, that was Kennedy Heights when I first moved in. I moved to Stowe Lane, it was Silverton. But on on Zenzel, I think that was Kennedy, I believe it was Kennedy Heights, yes. Mm -hmm. I lived on Zenzel before I moved to uh, Stowe Lane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was there a reason why you decided to move up to, to, to Cincinnati, or you just wanted to get a change of scene? Well, all my work was in Cincinnati. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, you started, you mean your, your music stuff? Yes. You started playing shows at more places up, up there? Everything was in Cincinnati. In fact, I think I was working for the government, too, at that time. That's right. Yeah, that's yeah. when, 54, I think. Yeah, I worked for, the, worked for the government when I moved. So all my work was in this area. And this, that was a nice section out there, Kennedy Heights, at that, that time. Yeah. And uh, as I say, I had friends out there. and. Uh, I had to play that at the church up there a couple of times with, with my groups, my core groups to come over. And, and then my friends helped me move. Uh, they wanted me to come over here. <laughs> so they, they got a truck together and they moved some of my stuff for me. Were there, were there any music venues in Kennedy Heights or Silverton when you moved up, up here in, in the 50s? Or was that more, yeah. I, I think, didn't Avondale have some jazz clubs and where where were the jazz clubs and uh, where was the place to go for, for nightclubs? Uh, well, Reading Road, uh, they had Toddy's, Danny's, 19th Hole, all in that area, and I had played all of it at one time. And was that Avondale and Reading? Avondale, yeah. Okay. That was between Rockdale and, and Union. Okay. All in that area, they had uh, those clubs, where and they stayed busy too. We were busy every night in the week, Toddy's, yeah. Now they had clubs downtown like the bar and the hangar and those places. They were busy too. Mm -hmm. They don't exist anymore. I don't know. Mm -hmm. and, but you used to play sometimes at those places too, right? I played the hangar uh, by myself, solo, on a, a night off. I had a night off, I'd go down there and play. And then you also talked about downbeat. The Downbeat Club, that was over in Walnut Hills? Yeah, uh, Gilbert Avenue in Lincoln. I opened the Downbeat, yeah. That's why I showed you pictures of Esther Charles. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's come in and sit down with us on his bass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How would you critique his bass playing? Well, he was no expert bass, no <laughs> bass player, but he, he, did, he did okay. I heard he loved music. Yeah. Maybe not the greatest bass player, but... Yeah. I heard he was a really nice guy. Yeah, he was a very nice person, very nice person. Of course, after my bass player, well, I don't compare him with, you know, D. Hart Nelson in a way, but he, he was fun. He enjoyed it. I have pictures where we played together, yeah. He was there when he was in town, he stopped by Downbeat, yeah. Well, I was gonna ask you, you did those recordings with Lonnie Johnson. Did you do more recordings later on in your career? Did you do any kind of other recordings? No, only uh, my own group, we made uh, some nice tapes that I have, you know. Mm -hmm. I still have those, but not in a big studio. I, I, I guess with your, 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 the couple sessions you did with 
uh, Lonnie Johnson, did, did you, I, did you get, was that a union uh, session? Would you, you would have got, I guess so you were supposed to get paid for those sessions. I don't know <laughs> if you did. Oh yeah, yeah, you got paid for those. You got paid for those, yeah. And so you talked about the 19th hole, is that what it was? Yeah. How is that different from Toddy's? They were near each other, but would they be, did you have to play a different kind of music? Was it a different clientele or what? Uh, it's the same type, same type of music. People would just go from one place to the other because they were right. near each other? Same thing, same drinks, same, same, you know. I think Teddy Raymore was at Toddy's after I left there. And uh, I, I, I started the 19th hole solo by myself. Okay. Then later I had a, added a bass player and a drummer, I think, yeah, for a trio. I started out as solo. But I had a trio at Toddy's. At Toddy's, what was like your, what time would you start uh, there and when would it end? When, when would your night begin and when would it I think we played begin? from 9 to 2.30. Okay. 9 to 2.30. My yeah. longest hours was Sportsman Club. Right. But. Uh, I guess the Sportsman's Club, it must have, that must have been an interesting place to play. There must have been a lot of characters in the Sportsman's Club. I always get the impression it was kind of a rough, a rough place to, to be. <laughs> well, Newport at that time was, uh, I don't know, he used to call it Little Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I enjoyed both places. In fact, just about every place I've been, I've enjoyed. Yeah. Well, well, I was going to ask though, over in Newport, those those clubs that you were talking about, the Sportsman's Club and the Three Three Club and Alibi, they were all near each other. But that was that was for Black Entertainment. But I guess were black people they didn't they weren't allowed to go to those other casinos and clubs, were they? In no, no, no. Because uh, I worked at a place called uh, Dreamers, and the, the place on the uh, out near. Uh, Beverly Hills Country Club. I worked there too after. Uh, I was there about three weeks before they had the fire. Oh, right. I played in what they call the garden room. It's a white room, garden room. And we were there about three weeks before the fire. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, you talked about earlier, you had a photo of her with Sarah Mc McClaudy. She had an all girl band. Yeah, Sarah McLawler. Right. Yeah, she had a good. A nice band. They would come to Cincinnati maybe once a year, and I had the house band over there, mm -hmm. Sportsman Club, and uh, we were, I'd play with them sometimes, play together. They were very nice. She was a very nice person. Mm -hmm. She uh, was a piano player, wasn't she? Yeah, she played piano. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you ever uh, come across Charles Brown? Charles Brown, the the singer, piano player. Yes. I don't remember, remember where, but I think I met him one time, but I don't know. Because he, uh, well, he, he kind of got, he got sort of, a, I think he had a little gambling habit, and then he, I think he owed money to Screw Andrews, and he had to, he had to keep working for Screw Andrews for a few years. And then he, uh, I think then Screw's uh, did, was serving some time, so then he left town, but then Charles Brown came back and he, uh, Worked at a club over uh, in Clifton on Ludlow uh -huh. in the in the late '60s. Uh -huh. Talked to a couple of people who knew him, but I wasn't sure if you ever if your cro your paths had crossed. Much. No, I, I don't remember that part of it. Uh -huh. Or Amos Milburn, oh, Amos Milburn, he was another keyboard player. Yeah, the, the name for me, I don't admit, I never met him either. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, but when you started uh, working at the uh, at the law library, right? You well, you were you became a, a librarian. How often were you playing in clubs? Well, were I wasn't. Still, were you still? Uh, I, I wasn't doing. Out? I don't think I wasn't doing clubs at that time. I was taking the private jobs. I had a booking agency, Carol Sapel, uh booking agency, and most of my work were at country clubs, or okay. hotel dates. I'd play for weddings and things like that. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, one-nighters, more like. And I had a good book at the agency. She, she did a good job. 
I had three at one time, Ruth Best, Clyde Trask, and Carol Chappelle. Clyde Trask, didn't he do stuff with WLW? Didn't he? I think he did, yeah. I think, yeah, I've seen his name. In fact, we played, my band and his band played a couple of jobs together at different times. Well, we completely forgot your time on WLW doing live television. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you I, talk I, a little bit about, do you remember how that came about, how you got got the live, uh, what time you were on, and a little bit what you remember of that? I think that came about, we played it after I left Todd's one night. I received a call to come to WCPO with um, Bill Fields. Bill Fields, yeah, was a disc jockey over there, and the WCPO was a non-union station. And I told Bill, I said, "This, it's a non-union station. I don't think we can play there." So then I talked to Tony, the guy I worked for, and I said, that "If I go, they're going to find me." He said, "Go on, I'll pay the fine." So we went and played, and I think. Somebody from WLW heard us, and the fellow that was Bill, Bill Ramsey, mm -hmm. he contacted us and got us on the WC, WLW, and we were there for 14 weeks. We had a girl singer named Pat Baldwin. She sang with us in the, for 14 weeks, the summer replacement. So that's where I got over there, and that was a nice, a nice deal. And you talked about you would it was an afternoon show. Yeah. They used to have a wrestling match from four to five. We would come on from five to five thirty. So you followed the wrestling match, right? Every Saturday for about fourteen weeks. <laughs> Every Saturday, yeah. And you talked about you had a sponsor for that show, didn't you? Yep, yeah. Forrest Trademark, F A R R Trademark. They were our sponsor. Yeah. And didn't you say that they they sold ovens and stuff, and the guy wanted yeah, to be his they, own they, spokesman? Yeah, they sold a. Uh, yeah, that type of thing, uh, washers, dryers, whatever it was, things like that. And I don't want to get it. <laughs> but, but then you say that he, uh, you were telling me a story about how he wanted to uh, be on TV selling, demonstrating his product and he had some issues, like like it didn't open, didn't he, like yeah, the oven door didn't open? He had some, pro had some problems the first day of it, but uh, it finally got it working, whatever, like that. Mm -hmm. But I, I enjoyed that too. We had, I think we had a rehearsal, maybe a couple of hours before the show, with the girl Patty Baldwin, she's a, she's a nice singer. And I had uh, D. Hart Nelson and Johnny, I uh, can't think of his last name. I just remember you said the Casa Grande, right? Didn't you say you played the Yeah, Casa Grande, Grand. that was downtown. That was on Vine Street? I think it was Vine Street. What What was that place like? I, I just remembered that I... Well, we, they had shows. They had uh, dancers. And we had to play music for their shows. We had music sometimes stretched across the piano where they were uh, dancers. You mean they were like kind of like go-go dancers? Yeah, something like that. Possibly strippers? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we played for that. <laughs> yeah, that, Cassie Graham was very popular at one time. Wasn't that like what would be like an Over the Rhine? Yeah, yeah. No, wasn't that kind of, I think there were some rough rough places around? I've talked to people who said that sometimes you want to make sure you had your knife with you, like in knife fights. <laughs> I never carried my knife with me, but the, uh, I was careful in the area. Yeah. <laughs> they had the Cassie Grand and uh, another place down there, very good, very, very popular. I can't think of it now. But uh, See, the, the Gaiety was down. Remember the Gaiety? The Gaiety. Yeah, yeah, that was right where the library is now. Did, did you play there? No, 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 no. But you would, you would pop the, in there. That, that, was a, that was one of the places downtown that the, that the people would go to. Right. The cat, the, the cat and the Fiddle. The Cat and the Fiddle. Yeah, right. that was yeah. another place. Yeah. That was across the street from the what became the State Theater, but it used to it was a movie theater. Yeah. I don't remember the exact location, location of those places, but I remember all of them. He had the official the Casa Grand, several of them in the area. They were very popular. The Cat and the Fiddle, I thought they did kind of country-western music at some point. 
I, I didn't go there, so, but I, I don't know. I, right, but it was but around. It, uh, yeah. Somebody told me that. Yeah. Um, um, but you mentioned, okay, so you had toddies, you had the 19th hole? I played toddies, 19th hole. What was the other place that was there in Avondale? It was a place called Danny's, but it, it later became Sammy's. <laughs> Danny's, then Sammy's? Yeah, <laughs> Tony's brother ran Sammy's. <laughs> so I worked for him too. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a strip during that time, uh, Reading Road. Tony's, Danny's, Sammy's, 19th hole. That was a strip. And that's yeah. like the early 50s, I guess? Yeah, probably like that time. Yeah. Did you ever play up in People's Corner? Any 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 venues up there, like the Taddy Tally Ho? No. <laughs> no. Trying to think of some of the other places. Uh, well, I think those were more in the '60s. I'm thinking you yeah. were probably had your your law uh, library yeah. Uh, yeah. job. Yeah, I, I cut down after I went start working for the law library. So when you had that job, which you had for thirty some years, what time would you have to go on the work for that job? I'd go at 8.30 to, to 5, something like that. And you would still occasionally do sh uh, shows, uh, like weddings and things, like in the evening sometimes? Yeah, on the weekends I did that. Of course, with the Court of Appeals, I had not only a library, I, I worked the court where I called cases, sworn attorneys, and, and uh, all of that. Right. So uh, then later, my full job was in the library, but during that time, I we had another library, and I I worked the court. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I'm, I'm going to have one or two more questions because I know you got to go. Yeah. Okay. But um, how how long did you keep? Uh, I know you do you still play the piano, or how long were you still doing? Uh, how old were you uh, when you were still playing shows? Things. How how long did you keep up doing that? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know. I didn't play the shows too long. Most of mine was just entertainment, mm -hmm. dances, things like that. I played dances down at the, at the Netherlands, Hall of Mirrors, right. Caprice, all those places. But the, I didn't do shows too long. The most shows we did were the Casa Grand. Right. Yeah. But that was a limited a number of years. Do you know who owned the Casa Grand? No, I don't. Okay. Uh, I don't know. That had like a big stage. I guess they had to have some stage for these girls. Yeah, they had stage, dance, it was dancing stage. We were behind the stage, you know, on, on the stage with them, but they were in front of us. And you were playing piano, and did you have like a trio? Yes. I think I had a saxophone, maybe a bass, drums, piano. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, do you? I see you got a piano over here in the corner. Do you still mess around with that? Occasionally, I play. I still play at church to help out over there at my church, First Baptist Kennedy Heights. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I still play there. Mm -hmm. Still keep at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate the time talking right. with me about all this. Okay. okay. All right.